500 years ago Tuesday, 500 year anniversary of the Reformation. They were gathered all over the world to remember that day, 500 years earlier, when a Catholic monk named Martin Luther nailed to the door of the castle cathedral 95 theses in his understanding and the understanding of many at that time that the church had veered from the truth, that the church had begun to lay unbearable burdens on people, that the powerful people of the church, essentially its popes and bishops and theologians, had become greedy and power hungry, had become way too wealthy, and that greed, in practice at least, was turning the church inside out from its original understanding of itself. At its very worst, we were selling indulgences that guaranteed forgiveness of sins and access to heaven in order to build cathedrals. People began to think they had to earn salvation, that they had to earn God's love, that they could only experience God's love if it was mediated through a priest, never on their own personally. Things were not good at that time. Martin Luther did not post those 95 theses as an ultimatum to the church. Rather, he posted those 95 points as points for conversation with the leaders of the church. Yet what he did was courageous in a church where authority, authority was the only discerner of right and wrong. Martin Luther had no idea where that would lead. He had no idea the suffering that would follow. He had no idea how that movement of freedom and grace would gather steam and grow. He had no idea what that simple act of rebellion, of, of, of protest, what it would become. It would make him one of the great reformers in all of the history of religion. It would. Reformers. Reformers are courageous women and men who rise up out of the corruption of the good that becomes overwhelmingly awful for the many to do what little they can to help get communities they love back on track. Let me say it again. Reformers are courageous women and men who rise up out of the corruption of the good that becomes overwhelmingly awful for too many to do what little they can to help get communities they love back on track. Jesus was a great reformer. It was all he really wanted to do was to reform Judaism to reform the Judaism he loved with all his mind, heart, soul, and body. Over a thousand years of Judaism, things also came to be corrupted that were good. Over time like that, so many things get layered on top of the kerygma of the, the initial good news, the initial purpose and intent of this community of faith. So many things get layered on top of it from all the cultures and from all the centuries. And it just gets, it starts to bury the essential teaching, turning things like as good as the commandments were and the law of Judaism, turning them almost into idols, so much so that they got worshipped instead of the value of relationship, so much so that if people didn't keep the commandments, actually they were cast out from each other. So there came Jesus, Jesus who had no, who saw the pain it was causing his people he had no intentions of starting a new religion. He only wanted to reform Judaism to help her get back on track, to get back to that kernel of truth that he loved so much in her. But you know, change is hard. Change is very hard. And so the leaders of his church, the leaders of the synagogues, they reacted against this desire for reform from this man, they reacted to it defensively, 
absolutely defensively. They were jealous of the power he had with people in their lives. It threatened their well-being and their place and their understanding of reality that had led to so much security for them that they didn't want to risk anymore. So what did they do? They excommunicated Jesus. They cast him out and his followers out from the synagogue. And when they cast him out and his followers with him, that movement of reform took on a life of its own, and it became Christianity. It became us right now as Christians in this world, and that didn't come with a small amount of bloodshed, starting with the blood of the reformer himself, Jesus. Jesus was a great reformer. It's all he wanted to do was reform but it was how he was responded to that led to this rupture. Martin Luther was a great reformer. 1,500 years later, along comes Martin Luther, who also saw the pain of people, who also saw, had the sense of how off-track thing had become. He was also a man burdened psychologically with an incredibly excessive scrupulosity and just constant guilt that came from the sense that he was never worthy, never worthy, never worthy of God's love, that God's love was something he had to earn because he was told that he had to do all these things to get to heaven. And one day, one day in his struggle, his mighty struggle with self-hate and self-loathing, he had a remarkable religious experience of being loved in his sin, of being loved as a sinner, of being loved so far from what was being preached in the churches at the time. All of a sudden he began to see how far the church had come from being the church of the early disciples of Jesus. Martin Luther did not want to start a new religion. He wanted to reform the church he loved. He wanted to reform the Catholic Church, which also over those 1,500 years had accrued so much stuff that was burying the essential good news, the kerygma, that would be liberating, not confining and enslaving, but liberating. But change is hard. Those in power, those greedy and power hungry who lead will resist. They will resist any suggestion of change and resist they did. Martin Luther, four years later, was excommunicated from the church. Blood was shed and Protestantism was born. In both instances, fear trumped faith. Those are the words of Pope Francis himself in the lead up to celebrating the Reformation. With Jesus and the Jews, with Martin Luther and the Catholic Church, fear trumped faith. Change is hard. It does not come easy. You and I know that from our personal lives. You and I know that in the places we work and in our families. The Protestant Reformation, my friends, ended up happening because Martin Luther, like Jesus before him, got kicked out because the powers that be refused, refused to read the signs of the time, to see what was going on in the world and trying to find a way for the church to respond to those things in new ways that are consistent with the old, conserving the best of the past bringing it forward, but being able to adjust along the way to the issues of the day. Because they ended up in the end, got, they got defensive instead of interested. They reacted instead of listening. And finally, finally they did, they had too much to lose. They decided. And so this wasn't going to happen, this reform whether it was Jesus's of Judaism or Martin Luther's of the Catholic Church. Nobody wants to lose power, you know? And when change happens, somebody loses power. And maybe it was time. But in neither instance, neither instance, did this split have to happen. The lesson of the Reformation is clear. Three words, change or die. 
Change or die. My friends, there is not an institution you are a part of, from your fraternity to your university, from your town or to our nation, from your parish to the universal church, including the CSC, that does not stand in need of constant reform, resetting, recalibrating, learning how to read the signs of the times, and figuring out creative, powerful, life-giving, consistent ways to respond to the challenges of our day. To respond to them and be faithful to that reformer Jesus which is really what Martin Luther wanted to do was be faithful to that reformer Jesus if institutions do not change they will die if families do not change they will die if you and I do not change we will die Change is the rule of the universe. The theory of evolution is based on the need for everything, everything, without exception, if it is to survive, to change. No institution is exempt from this, including the Roman Catholic Church in 2017. It has to change if it wants to live. Not once. Not every 1,500 years or 500 years, but over and over again, constantly looking at the circumstances, the signs of the time which the gospel demands. The ability to adapt, the ability to be resilient, defines the ability to succeed. That's true for each of us and our families and our friendships and our church. That's what it means in the end. Change or die. But change is hard. Every time change happens, there's a struggle with power to gain power. There will always be resistance to change. That's the nature of the beast. If you want to change a person, if you want to change your family, if you want to change your neighborhood, if you want to change the church, if you want to change the CSC, somebody's going to always resist, resist the change, always. Even in my own self, I can tell. I can tell when it's time for me to change. Feedback from friends are saying, Gary, that old way of being with us isn't working anymore. We used to like your sense of humor, but now it's keeping people at a distance. Totally. <laughs> I know for a fact, I hope you do too, that we resist change. It's natural to us, but it's unnatural to success. It really is. Oh my gosh. New free formers, it seems to me, are being raised up among us even now. And I'd propose to you that our Holy Father, Pope Francis, is potentially one of the great reformers in the history of our church. Already begun the reformation he's calling for. Away from putting doctrine and truth and dogma over relationships and engagement and dialogue. He keeps calling us back to them. And some of us in the church want him to excommunicate those who don't think like we do. And he refuses to do that to anybody, including his harshest critics. He understands a whole new pastoral sense of the way of being church that's run by compassion, a church of compassion, not a scent of the mind, but the compassion of the heart. Our Father, Holy Father, is doing that right now. And as you read in the paper, I'm sure, the, the resistance is enormous to him. The persecution is there for him now in his own life because he's seeking to reform the church. That's what happens. It is almost to be expected, sadly. He wants to bring the church out from being controlled by dogmas and rules that don't really apply much anymore or at least are getting the way of the heart become more pastoral and compassionate. There are those who don't want to change. And somehow, if you get too compassionate, you can get criticized for that. I know that for a fact. Trust me. I think I told you once a while back, several years ago, we had a bishop once who will go unnamed. <laughs> <laughs> My desire with people who think differently than the church is to be really truly compassionate to them and include them the best I know how and meet people where they're at. 
But I've been told by bishops included that sometimes I'm not clear enough, clear enough about what's a sin, what's intrinsically evil. And when I asked the archbishop one day after he told me that, who is the arbiter of what is too compassionate? Now I'm thinking in my head, Jesus, right? And he looked me in the eye and he said, I am. <laughs> you are never to be more compassionate than I am, Gary. Father Brown, actually, he called me. Wow. Do you see why the church stands in need of reform along the way? It was Cardinal Newman who said, you know, this is called a Newman Center. It was Cardinal Newman who said, to live is to change. To be perfect is to change often. To live is to change. To be perfect is to change often. Cardinal Newman, now blessed Cardinal Newman, on his way to canonization someday, we hope, understood that even dogma and doctrine must adopt, must evolve, carrying forward the best and discarding that which is an oppression to people in our day. Yes, reformation is difficult. There will be letting go on all sides. If Judaism would have been willing to listen to Jesus, we would, they would, we would not have had to split off from them. If the Catholic Church had listened to Martin Luther, we would not have had, they would not have had to split off from us. If we're not willing to let go of the unnecessary, to re-found ourselves on the necessary, it will be the end of everything we love. We are reformers, my friends. All of us are reformers. We must resist, protest against anything that is off message from the gospel of Jesus of Nazareth in those first 300 years of Christianity. We must protest, as did Jesus and Martin Luther, against anything in our institution that is putting too heavy of a load on everyday Catholics that perhaps is making them feel in horrible about themselves, are cut off from the community over just who they are. Even our leaders are sometimes unwilling to bear the burden of that. You heard the gospel just proclaimed. Jesus was complaining that the leaders of a church were putting unnecessary burdens on the people that they weren't even following. But we must protest only with love. Love for what is the best in us, as Jesus did, as Martin Luther did. And begin only with conversation, these points of conversation, and let the Holy Spirit figure it out from there. I love the Catholic Church. Like Martin Luther, I gave my life to the Catholic Church. Any disagreement I have the with the church is a lover's quarrel only, like so many of you in your marriages. You don't threaten to leave or get divorced every time things don't work out. You hang in there with each other, and you try to work at it. That's the kind of relationship I want to have with my church. If I happen to disagree, mostly with process, not dogma or doctrine, true that. But if I disagree, it can only be a lover's quarrel, nothing else. And I have to say, I will be forever grateful to that day 500 years ago when Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses to the door of the castle church. He only wanted to talk, but the leaders didn't want to listen. And so they reacted. They battened down the hatches and excommunicated. But after much resistance and bloodshed, our leaders finally got it. And really, almost truly, in a sense, every single one of those 95 points we have attended to and made part of our life together in communion right now. But why all that resistance? Why all that bloodshed? Why do people keep hurting each other and dispensing themselves from hearing the message? The church I love is partly because of the reformer who only asked to talk about this stuff. 
real issues are confronting the church today. I don't even pretend to know the answers or how to begin to answer. It's now become the law of our land that gay marriage is legal. The women's movement has gained tremendous momentum in the West. There's a huge growth in knowledge, a knowledge revolution, new science that we haven't begun to wrap our brains around, environmental issues, population shifts. The church for the longest, longest time, the church was white, European, Western. And now it's changing. There's more from South America, more from Africa, more Central America. More and more of this is beginning to happen in the church. So we must all ask, not just some, we must all ask, how do we, re how do we recover the spirit of the early church in 2017? How do we recover the spirit of the early church now in 2017? What is the church we need right now going forward in this day, keeping the best, especially the kerygma of Jesus of Nazareth? What is the church we need now? Who will be the next reformer? We are reformers all. Can you begin to see yourself as a reformer of the institutions you're a part of? Reading the signs of the times, helping the church meet the needs of people in your day. What is God calling us to now in the light of the very beginnings of the church and the gospel? Because the truth is, we are reformers. All. Change or die. Christianity must change or die. So here's to the next 500 years. <laughs>